This is the Sandown circuit, 15 miles from the city of Melbourne. Nearly two miles around, it's a power circuit with long, fast straights and tight corners. The S's at the top end of the course are testing on brakes, tyres and suspensions. For a standard touring car to last six hours here, everything has to be just right. So right away. Another gear. Which brings us then to Dunlop Bridge, very fast, approach it wide. Shell Corner, the fastest on the circuit, is followed by Peters, the slowest. At this circuit on November the 21st, 1965, a gruelling test of series production cars was held. They call it the Sandown International Six-Hour Race. Our film is about this race and... This is a story about two cars, a man, his mechanics and his drivers. The man is Alec Mildren, former Grand Prix winner and Australian champion driver. He owns and manages the biggest racing team in the Southern Hemisphere. His chief mechanic, Glen Abbey, and assistant, Stuart Randall, have prepared the Alphas, the GTA and the TI. His drivers are Dr. Roberto Bussinello, flown out specially for this race from Italy, where he's an Alpha Works driver. He will share the wheel of the GTA with Sydney driver, Ralph Setch. Frank Gardner, an Australian international driver based in England, has also been brought out by Mildren. He will share the wheel of the TI with Kevin Bartlett, the rising young driver of the Mildren team. But a six-hour race needs more than drivers and cars. It needs long and careful preparation. In the Mildren workshops, which are also the service department of his prestige car business, the team mechanics prepare the cars. Engines are dismantled and reassembled with precision and care. Every function is checked to factory specification. Both cars have basically the same engine, a twin overhead cam unit of 1,570 cubic centimetres. The gearboxes in both cars are standard alpha and have five forward speeds. The TI is a five-seat family saloon with a top speed in excess of 120 miles an hour. The GTA is the sports version of the Alfa Romeo GT and is a four-seater with a light alloy body and is therefore faster than the TI. Every day, for three weeks before the race, the team practiced refueling and tyre changes. Every second saved here will keep the pit stops down to a basic minimum. Drivers, as well as mechanics, have to familiarise themselves with the correct procedure. Finally, everything that could be done had been done, and the cars were loaded for the 600-mile journey to Melbourne and the Sandown circuit. Practice day, a day of worries and decisions for the team manager. However, he has experts to help and guide him from the many companies who actively and financially support motorsport. Final preparations are made. Glen Abbey protects the car cooling system from holding by stones by adding a special leak preventative. An expert is available to help the team manager select the correct type of spark plug for the running conditions of the race. The tyre companies support the entrance by offering tyre changing and wheel balancing services. By testing their products under these severe conditions, these companies are able to benefit the average motorist. Mildren checks the fueling and notes how many gallons go into each car. Mileage during practice will affect his race day strategy. All is ready and the cars are on the track for the start of practice. Bussinello is first away. All the field are out now, trying to better their class lap times. Some cars didn't get very far. Mildren holds up a plug spanner. This means, come in on your next time around, it's time to change drivers.
crew fly into action. The weeks of practice have taught them to work as an efficient team. Businello has very little English, so one of his friends acts as an interpreter to tell Mildred about the car and track conditions. Some cars are trying just a little too hard. Mildred has to keep an eye on the main opposition. People like Harry Firth, long distance expert, Peter Manton, who be leading the BMC attack in a Mini Cooper S with Brian Foley. In Cortinas are Bob Jane and Canadian Alan Moffitt, who has a BRM engine Cortina. Practice times were good. Gardner and Bartlett in the TI got around in 1.27.8. In the GTA, Bussanello and Satch managed a staggering 1.25.9. Moffat in the Lotus Cortina did 1.27.2, so he'll be the man to watch. Mildred is happy with practice, but the race will not be over and won until five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. A lot of things can and did happen in that time. Race day, and Bussanello and Gardner will drive the Alphas for the first session. Moffat screams away along the grass. By shell, he's amongst the leaders. He takes them at Peter's. Now one of the race sensations. Charlie Smith in the Mini has blown a brake hose. At 80 miles an hour, he plows into the back of the Seaton Firth Cortina, who in turn hit Bob Jane. Smith and Seaton are out of the race a half a mile from the start. By the time he reaches Dunlop, Alan Moffat was so far in front on the first lap that one of our cameramen thought he was a late starter trying to catch up. With Moffat treating the race as a five-lap sprint, the field begins to string out. On lap two, Bussinello starts to bring the GTA through and reduce the gap to Moffat, who is already lapping some of the slower cars. Bussinello was in second place and began to press Moffat, who was cornering wildly. In the meantime, Jane brought his damaged car into the pits for inspection. Bussinello presses Moffat coming out of the S's, causing him to brake late. Moffat has a locking brake and punishes his tyres. Bussanello repeats the performance at Shell, and only expert driving keeps Moffat on the track. Next time round, the GTA passes the Cortina in the S's. Alan Moffat lost his lead for the rest of the race. Bussanello sets out to open the gap on the other leaders and the floaty roar of the GTA is heard in Dunlop Strait. Gardner in the meantime is playing his part in the plan and brings the TI through the field, lapping steadily in the 130s. Moffat nearly loses his car in shell as a locking wheel grinds a flat on his tyre. At 11.42, Moffat brings 28 into the pits. His left front tyre looks like a hexagonal nut. He 
ignores pleas for a tyre change and rejoins the field. The two alphas are now running first and second overall and in their class. The time is 11.50. Alan Moffat's tyre finally lets go in shell and he nearly cleans up pit row as he comes to rest. drama at three minutes past 12 when the Manton Foley Mini number 47 bursts its gearbox housing putting them out of the race. The Hale and Holden Mini number 48 takes over and forges through the class. Five hours to go. At 12.20, cars start coming in for driver changes and fuel. Some of the bigger cars have already been in. one o'clock and Mildred calls in the GTA for fuel and a change of driver. The pit crew are ready. They will check the pads on the four disc brakes, measure the tread on the tyres and put in eight gallons of fuel. The car is in and a worried Mildred asks Bussinello if he's happy with the sound of the car. Bussinello agrees all is not well. Mildred makes a quick decision and elects to carry on with Satch as the driver. The car is out again in under two minutes and is still in the lead. Jim Palmer, New Zealand champion driver, has taken over the Moffat Lotus but is hampered by brake trouble. One twenty-three and action in Shell Corner. Bill Burns goes wide in the Jaguar, Jerry Merritt in the Renault swerves to avoid him, the rest happens quickly. Merritt is not hurt but the car is written off. Both Renaults are now out of the race. In the meantime, the Jane car, which has been out for 30 laps with brake trouble, rejoins the field. Tragedy for the Mildred team as Sat brings in the sick GTA to retire. The TI is now in first place, with the Poon Holland Cortina 31, an entry from Hong Kong, well back second. The time is 1.30. Bussinello's Italian friends sadly wheel their hero's car to the dead car park. Satch gets a word of comfort from Bartlett. Mildred must make a decision whether to keep Gardner going or bring him in to look at the race. A word with lap scorer Gail Satch, the TI is four laps ahead. A word with Bartlett. Mildred tells him to regain lost laps and then lap steadily. The decision is made. The crew is ready. They realize there is no time to be lost on this stop. Bonnet open, check oil, water, fuel in, inspect brakes. Gardner tells the young driver of the condition of the circuit, where oil and rubber have built up. A new tyre was not needed, but Milton ordered one in the interest of safety. But it is in and away in two minutes. The time is 1.52.
By two o'clock, Bartlett had regained the lap lost in the pit stop and was four laps ahead of the Poon Holland car. George Reynolds in the Jane car decides to rejoin the race. Russellhead Cooper is in with the bonnet loose. Shortly after, the car suffered an internal hemorrhage and retired. The hind hall Fraser Mini blows a tyre and makes a stop. At this stage, the second car overall, the Poon Holland Cortina, lost a lot of time when the boot wouldn't close. Five and a half minutes later, they wired it down. Steve Holland sets out to make up the lost laps. The TI is now eight laps in front. When the lead is down to six laps, Milden realises it's time for his number one driver to take over and gives Bartlett the signal to come in. This time the two offside tyres are changed brake pans inspected, and fuel added. Mildren takes off the relief driver sticker. The drivers compare notes. Gardner is in and away in 150. Five hours, the TI is first by six laps, and car 31 is one lap ahead of the Moffat Palmer Lotus. But the passing hours and the pace is being felt by a lot of cars. For many of the bigger cars, handling has become a problem. With their brakes worn to metal, they're overshooting the corners. Many have changed brake pads and linings. The TI by now has made over 4,000 brake applications and many gear changes, but has not needed any attention in the handling department. The Peebles Mustang is clouted by the Crea Gross Bellet. The Bellet spins out and calls into the pits for a check. The TI continues to lap steadily, but Steve Holland has pulled out all the stops to catch it. By 4.45, he is four laps behind. Stewart Triumph 2000 is blowing smoke and sounding sick, but some people seem to have lost interest in the race. Three minutes to go and the TI seems late. Glen Abbey looks back up the straight, but here he is and a relieved Mildred gives the last pit signal. Mildred checks with the timekeepers just to make sure, but it's five o'clock and the chequered flag is out waiting for Gardner and the TI. In the meanwhile, the Palmer Moffat Cortina has retired at Lukey's with a blown diff, less than a mile from the finish. Frank Gardner crosses the line 6 hours, 1 minute, 1.2 seconds and 462 miles after he left the grid. Now the strain is off the Mildren pit. Alec Mildren can relax his tired muscles after 6 hours of standing on the pit apron. Gardner and Bartlett average 77 miles an hour for the 6 hours. Who said the TI wasn't a family car? 
Bussinello's Italian cheer squad at last are happy. Now the laurels of victory. For Gardner and Bartlett, a well-deserved win. The TI, Old Faithful, has won for the second year in succession. It's a triumph for the drivers, a triumph for Glen Abbey, Stuart Randall and the pit crew for their preparation. And it's a triumph for Alec Mildren, who has faith in the cars that he sells. Invited by the Japanese Automobile Federation to enter the 1969 JAF Grand Prix. The offer was extremely attractive and so we decided to have a go. We entered both our cars to be driven by Kevin Bartlett and Max Stewart, took our three mechanics, Glen Abbey, Bob Grange and Ian Gordon. Merv Wackett and his wife came along to keep an eye on his engine in our Formula 2 car. In fact, our party was almost enough to take advantage of a group booking, so we invited the other Australian contestants to join us. Leo Gagan and Glyn Scott made up the numbers. We flew by Philippine Airlines, who gave us a comfortable and enjoyable trip both ways. Leo Gagan brought his mechanic and a spare engine. As events turned out, he could have left his spare engine behind and brought his wife instead, but he was not to know this beforehand. The cars were flown by Qantas the following day. We chose Qantas because they had pallet loading facilities which save us the trouble of dismantling the cars. The Qantas porters were fascinated by the racing cars and each car on a pallet was lifted into the cargo section of the aircraft on the hydraulic lift. The car was then pushed into the compartment and tied down on a waiting pallet. The JAF found accommodation for our party at a modern westernised hotel at Gotemba, some 14 miles from the circuit. It was a pleasant place and very comfortable. In the background, Mount Fuji. The next day we travelled by coach to have a look at the circuit. The Fuji International Speedway is some 80 miles from Tokyo by high-speed motorway. We had the circuit to ourselves that day and found the superb facilities included lock-up garages in the pit area. Bob and Glenn checked the cars over before our private practice run. 
Our mechanics work hard and long hours during the next three days. In the meantime, we went for a tour around the track. At the end of the long pit straight is a curved downhill drop banked to 30 degrees. Our cars would come into this corner at about 180 miles per hour. At the bottom of the hill is a sharp right-hander to bring us back below the pits. Then another sharp left-hander takes us further around the course. We come into a 120 mile an hour right-hander which brought us back into the mile and a quarter long pit straight. The next day was official scrutineering and practice. The officials were smartly turned out in pale mauve jackets. Number 24 is a factory entered Formula 2 Colt. Number 17 is a Bellet Olivetti Special. The scrutineering was remarkably thorough. We had no trouble and found the officials most courteous and helpful. Much to our surprise, they even weighed our cars, and to our delight, we found we had the lightest two and a half litre and Formula 2 cars. To complete the inspection, they even have a pit so that they may inspect underneath the cars. After the inspection, they shield our cars from a portable bowser. Finally, the seals are placed on the cars and we are allowed to return to the pits. On race day, we travelled to the course by coach again, but this time we had a police escort to get us through the overcrowded roads. 62,000 people came to watch the racing. The pits were more crowded on race day and included the inevitable Japanese wrestler. The cars are wheeled out for final inspection and this formality went on for hours. In first practice the day before, Bartlett had set fastest time of 1 minute 55.39, but then blew a hole in one of the pistons. Our mechanics worked half the night to replace the engine. Fortunately, we had taken the spare engine with us. Gagan managed a 1 minute 54.13, second fastest of the day. Gary Cooper did a 1 minute 54.7, which also put him on the front row. Fastest time of the day in the second session was local hero Tetsu Ikazawa in the Formula 2 Colt with a 1 minute 53.81, which put him in pole position. Although Bartlett had no further practice that day, his time secured him the fourth place on the front row of the 434 grid. Stewart had pole on second row. The photographers are allowed in the pits for the first time and they make a beeline for our cars. During practice, we all had to modify our suspension settings to allow for the 30 degree curved banked track. The Subaru Special had unusual air intake pipes for the carburetors. Must have been a fresh air fiend. Tatsu Ikazawa is the Japanese champion. His car featured an unusually large oil cooler. Things began to wind up a little when the international drivers were called upon to join in a grand parade. Headed by a group of Boy Scouts, our men tagged along a little sheepishly, wondering what was going to happen next. The ceremony started off with a bang. and then went on with the speeches of welcome to all and sundry.
the Anzac team seemed to tower over the local drivers. Now we could get down to the serious business of motor racing. Team tactics were all important as the race was a long one. 40 laps of nearly four mile course, over 150 miles, much longer than our drivers were used to doing. Leo Gagan's ready smile and the friendly approach quickly made him popular with the local press. The Sydney Morning Herald's man in Tokyo, Max Such, came along to find out what we were up to. Ikazawa's was cult waits patiently for the race. Gary Cooper's new Orphan 600 was fitted with a Repco V8. At long last, we could roll the cars out for a warm-up lap. Max Stewart looks determined as he gloves up. I was pretty busy too. Kevin Bartlett adjusts his mask. At long last, we can try our cars for size. After the warm-up lap, the cars are assembled on the grid. And the drivers have to get out again for a meeting with the clerk, of course. Hmm, I wonder whether the tyres are going to last the distance. The last few minutes always seem the longest as our drivers wait for the start. This fellow must have been with a ballet company. Stand by. Flags down. Away they go. Beautiful start. Cooper just gets the edge on Bartlett as they accelerate down the straight. Cooper's just leading, but watch Ikazawa cut the corner and jump the queue down the chute. Gary Cooper lost it on the next bend, and now Okazawa is in front, followed by Max Stewart, Bartlett and Gagan. Into the left hander underneath the pits, Okazawa leads Stewart, Bartlett and Gagan. Second time round, and Stewart follows the wily Okazawa, who ought to know his way round his home circuit. Gagan is third, Matsuko in the second works Formula 2 cult fourth, and slowing down to fifth place, Bartlett. Next time round, Stuart passes Ikazawa, only to be repassed further down the straight. Now Bartlett's in trouble, and he wheels the car in, suffering from loss of power. Another piston is hold, and that's the end of his effort for the day. With Kevin Bartlett out of the race, Max Stewart keeps up the good work with a tremendous dice with Ikazawa. Ikazawa dives into the near side lane to keep in the lee of the wind. Stuart tucks in for the tow. They pass and repass, much to the huge delight of the crowd. Ikazawa knows his way round for sure, but he cannot shake off the determined Max. Ikazawa is leading, Max is in second place. Now Max Stewart is in front again. They keep up the spirited dice for the next few laps, but on the 10th lap, Ikazawa lost steam and came into the pits to change his place. He came out again, but retired soon after with a faulty ignition. This gave Max the lead, and he continued to enjoy his moments of glory. The engine was running crisply, and he was lapping in steady one minute 55s. However, Gagan was now moving up and getting ready to pounce. He had started slowly to avoid stripping his new gears 
and had driven quietly round waiting for the opposition to fall by the wayside. He was lying fourth in the first two laps and had moved up a couple of places as first Bartlett and then Ikazawa dropped out. On the 16th lap, Gagan overtook Stewart and from then on led all the way. Stewart tried to keep up with him at first until we signalled him to ease off. There was no point in letting Max stay up with Gagan. Even a good 1600 can't beat a good two and a half litre. We just had to settle for second place and hope nothing broke. In the meantime, Glyn Scott was leading Cato in another Formula 2 colt. The Cosworth FBA seemed to have the edge on the Mitsubishi engine. All went well until the 25th lap when Max came in with his radiator empty. We had to take our time refilling the water as the engine was stove hot. Then of all the rotten luck, the starter motor wouldn't work. When it finally decided to turn, the motor fired immediately. Although we had lost eight laps, Stewart went out to qualify as a finisher. There was nothing wrong with Merv Waggett's engine. In fact, it was going better than ever. In his last lap, Max Stewart did his fastest lap and set a new lap record for Formula 2 cars for the course. He got it down to 1 minute 54.2, an average speed of 116 miles an hour on the 3.7 mile track. In the closing laps, Gagan maintained his lead and Rowley Levis had now fitted nicely into second slot. Glyn Scott seemed to fade a little in the last few laps and was overtaken by Cato in the Formula 2 Colt. It was a much longer race than we'd been used to, with 40 laps totalling 150 miles, taking nearly an hour and 20 minutes. The last seconds are ticking by. Here he comes. And the flag man goes out to wave the winner in. Down on the track side, we wait for Leo to come in after his well-deserved win. Gagan comes in after winning the 1969 Japanese Grand Prix in record time. Followed here by Kato in the Formula 2 Colt and Max Stewart having done a good job despite his troubles. Gagan set a new lap record of 1 minute 52.69, an average of 119.7 miles per hour. On the rostrum, Gagan is top of the pile, with second placement Rowley Levis on his left, and third placement Sohi Kato on his right. Down on the tarmac, we discuss the features of the race with our crew. An interesting point about the event was that we had to fit starter motors to our cars in order to comply with the regulations. The Japanese Automobile Federation were running their Grand Prix according to accepted international regulations. Australia must be the last country in the world where push starting is still allowed. Now that we have our starter motors fitted, we might as well keep them on for future use. But for the starter motor trouble on Max's car, we might have been better placed. We had time to reminisce on our return journey with Philippine Airlines. It had been a wonderful experience for all of us. We went together as a team. We probably helped each other more than ever before. As an Australian and New Zealand team, we were successful in collecting first, second and fourth places in the JAF Grand Prix. Altogether, it was a very successful trip to Japan and we are hoping to be invited there again. 
The Mount Fuji Motor Raceway is magnificent with excellent facilities for spectator and competitors alike. The motor racing is put on very well indeed and is a great credit to their organisation. Whilst we are sure the Japanese learned something from our driving and cars, we are sure we can learn a lot from them too.